Well, I'd like to welcome all of our K4 users to this little video we're doing and introduce David Hostler and Trenton Blizzard from Taylor Guitars. And uh, uh, we want to talk about this, uh, this new device we have, the K4 Equalizer. We're awfully excited and proud to bring it to the market now. Um, this is a user's guide and we're going to go into how do, we, how do we use this, but before we do we thought we'd just really talk about what it is and, and what it can do for people. Um, in a nutshell, this builds on the expression system Correct. and it gives us very high quality audio in a small portable package, mm -hmm. kind of in a way that hasn't been done, then been done before. And by that, we really are talking about portability and price point. At right. 895, we're we're bringing a, a a piece of gear to the market that has the same features and components that we've normally spent 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 dollars for. But why don't we jump right in, David? You can kind of start talking about some of its features and and really the uh, the most important points about this. Uh, the two features that to me are the most significant as a player are. First of all, the sonic quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a piece of gear designed by Mr. Rupert Neve. I mean, it has that sonic heritage in it. Matter of fact, intentionally designed to have the same quality and signature sound that his early consoles had. Mm -hmm. That's the first feature. The second feature is this. Uh -huh. It's portable. I have all that quality that I would expect in a high price piece of gear or even a console in a little box here, and not only that, that can be powered with a couple C-cell batteries. Yeah. Well, that's so important, the the fact that we can take this with us where you could take quality into a backyard right. with you if you want now. Mm -hmm. Now, it's got inputs, it's got outputs, so does everything else. What's in between those, I think we've kind of grown sometimes to assume that it's all the same quality and we would just shop for price. but. That's true. Uh, what's in between doesn't matter. Yeah. And uh, it is a common misconception that all the gear is the same, it's just all priced differently. Yeah. Um, a lot of manufacturers don't want to put the time and the material into a device uh, just be simply because it's expensive to make mm -hmm. a high quality product. And so it's, it's nice to have that kind of quality actually in a box that size at the price that it's at. Mm -hmm. Now one example of components like that would be transformers. That's a major uh, component in the device. The transformer is and has been a defining factor in the audio signal chain for giving certain recordings, if you will, a certain sonic character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ma magnetics has played a big role in uh, audio recording and, on, and actual live audio performances. Right, and it just has a, it has a sound that we like to hear that is correct. Uh, transformers are inherently non-linear. Uh, engineers typically look at transformers on paper all day long in two dimensions, figuring out voltage ratios, current ratios, things like that, making sure it's stable. But uh, the one thing you cannot predict, and even measure for that matter, is how it's going to sound. Right. And so it takes, a, it takes a really good transformer manufacturer to make a transformer sound good. Now these transformer manufacturers have, it's not so much a uh, design or engineering on it as it is an art form. That is correct. And, and it's a kind of a build and test and build and test and which and takes many years yeah. to develop. Correct. Well, finding the right materials, finding the way to wrap the material, finding the correct bobbin material to get the right frequency response, and then somebody inherently has to listen to it and, and give and say mm -hmm. that one sounds good. Yeah. yeah and that's what uh, that's what's inside the box. Yeah, you know, just a, an interesting point is that the transformers in this come from the place in the world, you know, and no one else can make them for us. Correct. We would yeah. hear the difference. We would hear the difference. Yeah, absolutely. That is it's kind of like you can only get a Taylor guitar from Taylor Guitars. Exactly. And you can only get these transformers from Carnhill. Right. right. And it's you the know. same. There are mm -hmm. other guitars, and they have their sounds. Carnhill has transformers, and they have their sound. Very good. Well, so we, we get in and out of this, and but we've got lots of EQ. You want to talk to us about that, David? Right. The EQ on here, um, particularly the first stage of it, is designed similar to the expression system in that it's voice specifically for acoustic instruments. When we first started looking at uh, designing the EQ for the expression system, we, we wanted to find out, well, where is that bass and, and treble that defines acoustic instruments? What range is it in? 
uh, we think of it as the cavity or Helmholtz resonance. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found is that a lot of gear was not voiced with its knee or center in that range, but usually was below that. Uh, we spent David, is that why when you turn the bass knob up on a lot of devices, they tend to sound like this yes. instead of just sounding deeper? They're really, they're really boosting things that aren't naturally occurring on the instrument. Okay. Uh, this is voiced specifically for that. Uh, we've also included in this device a complete sweepable, we call it a midsection, but it actually goes from 80 hertz, which is really low, to 8 kilohertz, which is very high. Uh, and you can sweep any of those frequencies and decide if you want to boost or cut those as well. Um, it's a parametric EQ, but it's not just any parametric EQ. It, well, it's an <laughs> elegant parametric EQ. Right. And what Rupert included on this was a Q control, was mm -hmm. the, which we'll be talking a little bit more about as we go into some demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other features, effects loop, right. balanced, tuner balanced effects right. loop. Right. Not just an effects loop, a balanced effects loop. Right. Most players these days, I mean, you want to be able to include your reverb or your chorus or a volume pedal in the, in the signal chain. Uh, so we made an effects loop on the back. We have a send and return. The ability to go in and out of that loop from the front panel. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of say, yes, I want those effects in or not. But we also put a pre and post on the back, which allows you to decide, uh, are those effects re receiving the same tone controls? Mm -hmm. that you're adjusting on the front or not. So you mm -hmm. can go before or after those tone mm -hmm. controls. What's so important about it being balanced? Having a balance, well, balanced lines in particular are the way professional equipment and manufacturers have been designing a, a, their gear. Now, balanced lines do two things inherently. One, they allow you to reject outside noise from your, from your area, whether it be lighting mm -hmm. or motors or air conditioning, whatever, whatever extraneous signals you have. And they also allow you to balance low impedance lines, allow you to run long cable lines mm -hmm. without any degradation in your signal quality. Okay, correct. Yeah. So, so in reality, I could, if, if I found myself in one of the greatest studios in the world, you know, one of those that have the consoles that weigh 6,000 pounds back there, mm -hmm. and I showed up with this piece of gear in my bag, I've got uh, equivalent gear to condition my tone in my possession as they've got behind the glass. Correct. Yeah, they won't ask you to leave it in the bag. Right. <laughs> and if I show up at a at a, a junior high school to play for my kids in a little hall or the church basement with a with an old PA system that's really the opposite of that great recording studio, mm -hmm. I can use this to condition my sound and, and make a bad situation pretty pretty acceptable. Sure. Right, because that warmth and transparency that we think of in that upper range of pro audio gear mm -hmm. is part of the circuit design of this device. That's great. So again, it comes back to tone. Yes, And then does. our ability to add different effects, the tuner out, dedicated, right. so whatever tuner somebody likes and loves. Right, and there's a mute right switch, in. so it mutes the output and they can do silent tuning. Uh -huh. uh, since it is powered by batteries or a wall supply, the nice thing we've done with the LED here is that when you put batteries in and you're using it, it glows green uh, for approximately 10 hours of good battery use. Uh -huh. And when your signal or the power starts getting below a certain point, that'll turn from green to red. And you got uh -huh. about 30 minutes before distortion starts kicking in. Okay. But you know you have, again, a portable device that you don't have to look for a wall plug to plug uh -huh. it in if you're just walking on stage uh -huh. with all that sonic quality and heritage that comes with Rupert Neve Designs. So now I'm a guy, I've, I've, I've got a Taylor 810 with an expression system in it, and uh, for the last six months I've been pretty happy. I take my, my XLR cord, I plug directly into the snake, I send it back to the house. The sound sounds good. With this, I can plug into here, into this K4 mm -hmm. equalizer, then send it back to the house, and now I've got the possibility to condition my sound a little bit more. Uh, running straight in and straight out will actually improve the sound because of the transformers and the more robust circuitry that you can put in a in a larger box. Mm -hmm. I can add my effects, mm -hmm. that my favorite effects to the loop without degrading my expression system tone right. or the signal chain that we've developed in the, right. gu in the right. guitar. I can add my tuner to it. I can plug headphones in it and get adjusted before uh, a gig starts. I can drive multiple sources on amplifier on stage and right, the PA right. system. So it just what it does is it just almost explodes into a whole other level of control that I have. It's a it's a user control and it's a great tool for managing your gear. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it basically allows a player who wants to expand everything they do, it gives them kind of like the hub mm -hmm. and the ability to do that mm -hmm. and maintains that solid integrity that comes with well-designed equipment. Well, great. Well, thanks for the explanation on all those things. And why don't we just get right into how to use it and we'll start just going through the controls with the, with the people and showing them where to plug in and how to, how to make the adjustments. Excellent. In this section, we're going to take a quick tour of the front and back panels of the K4 and look at some of the functions and features. The K4 was designed to be easy to use and easy to understand. Looking at the front panel, the first button on the left is the phase button. Now the normal selection for this button would be in the out position. Your user's guide gives clear instructions on how to use a phase button effectively. The first two knobs you see to the right of the phase button are the low EQ and the high EQ control. Now these are active controls that can either boost or cut frequencies coming from your guitar. When they're in their center detent position, they're effectively out of the circuit and you do get a true flat response. You want to think of these controls, the low and the high, as your primary EQ circuit for the K4. The center section of the K4 is the mid-frequency section. Now there are three knobs clustered around a center button. On the upper right hand side you see the frequency select control. Now this select can choose frequencies from 80 hertz to 800 hertz with the button in the center in the out position. When you push the button in or the times 10 button that becomes a multiplier and the frequency select then goes from 800 hertz to 8 kilohertz. To the left of that is the shape control. Now what this shape control or the Q does is decides on what shape the frequency select will have. To the far left or counterclockwise it'll cover a wide range of frequencies and completely turned clockwise it'll cover a narrow band of frequencies. Now below that is the level control which allows you to boost or cut the frequencies that you've chosen using the frequency select and the shape control. The volume control controls the output of the K4. To the right of the volume control is a mute button. Pushing the mute button in will mute the output section of the K4 allowing you to tune discreetly. Back to the left of the volume control is a loop button. When you have effects inserted in the loop in the back of the K4, such as a reverb, a chorus, or a volume pedal, pushing that loop button will put the effect you've chosen in or out of the circuit. The headphone output jack is a quarter inch jack. It will not receive a mini plug. And the volume control for your headphones is right above that. Turning that volume control will not affect the overall output of the K4. The power on button for the K4 is on the far right. Now to the right of that is an LED that glows either green or red. The K4 is designed first to be run on the power supplied through the wall adapter, but it can be run on two C-cell batteries. If it's run on batteries, the LED will glow green as long as there's enough power to give good signal. Once that power has dropped below a certain level, that LED will go from green to red indicating that you have approximately 30 minutes of playing time before you need to replace your batteries. The back panel of the K4 is also designed to be extremely user friendly. Your K4 was designed to be powered primarily by an external DC power supply. But it can also be powered by batteries. If you forget to take your power supply to a gig, you can use two C-cell batteries, which will get you through approximately 10 hours of performance, but you should also use a power supply whenever possible. Now the DC power inlet is a barrel type jack which is wired to be tip positive and sleeve negative. The input section of the K4 will accept a wide range of signals and levels. Now it's been optimized for use with the Taylor Expression System, which is a balanced output but will also accept an unbalanced signal from other sources. The input jack of the K4 is multifunctional. It will accept three different types of connectors. 
an XLR tip ring sleeve or standard quarter inch. Be sure to see Chapter 4 of the User's Guide for more details on selecting the best input for your application. The effects loop of the K4 is a specially designed feature that allows you to integrate external effects without degrading the pure analog signal path between your guitar and the K4. It consists of three parts, a send, return, and a loop button. The loop button on the back determines the position of the effects loop related to the EQ section of the K4. Pre means the effects loop comes before the EQ section. Post means the effects loop will come after the EQ section. Again, refer to your user's guide for more specific instructions. The output section of the K4 has two output points. The XLR out is a low gain feed. It's a balanced line and would typically be used to go from the K4 to your snake and to a mixing console. The quarter inch output is a high gain output which can be run balanced or unbalanced. These outputs can be run individually or simultaneously. In other words, you could feed a mixer and an on-stage amplifier. The tuner output is used to send a signal to the tuner of your choice. Again, pressing the mute switch on the front panel will allow you to mute the outputs and to tune discreetly. The ground lift switch is a three position switch which can help you eliminate potential ground conflicts that result in ground loop noise. The normal operating setting for the ground lift switch is in the none position. Lifting the ground should only be explored in cases where ground conflicts cannot be resolved by lifting the ground on other elements in your system. Understanding what happens when you turn the knobs on an equalizer can be a bit confusing. What we're going to attempt to do now is demystify that process by showing you on a graphic exactly what happens when you turn those knobs we're going to demonstrate that by using the frequency spectrum and a K4 equalizer. The low EQ on the K4 equalizer is voiced specifically for acoustic instruments. When you turn up the gain control, the frequency curve looks like this. The knee is around 125 hertz. Now when you roll back past the center detent on the knob in the opposite direction, the frequency curve looks the same, only now you're subtracting those frequencies, and this is what it looks like. Rolling back to zero brings the unit back to flat. The high EQ can also be raised and produces this shape of a curve, affecting the notes or the harmonics in this range. When you turn the high EQ back past the center detent and turn the gain down, the curve looks similar, only now you're subtracting those frequencies. Bringing it back to zero brings the unit back to flat. The mid EQ section consists of three knobs, a frequency select knob, a Q or shape, times 10 multiplier, it's a button that pushes in and out, and a gain control. At this point, the frequency select is around 80 hertz. When we turn up the gain control, the shape of the curve is different than what we saw on the low EQ. And we'll go ahead and overlay the shape of the low EQ curve. So you can see that they're different and they're actually affecting different frequencies. So what we see is a curve around 80 hertz at its center with a different shape. We can now take that shape and we can decide where we want to place it by rolling the frequency select knob. Now you can see the different frequencies are being selected and are going to be affected when you're playing. We've rolled it all the way clockwise and we're at a 800 hertz now. By pushing in the times 10 multiplier that mountain will now move to 8 kilohertz. You can now roll backwards and select different frequencies above 1 kilohertz. 
This is a good illustration of how a parametric EQ works and how frequencies are selected and controlled. Now by turning the Q, we can decide the shape of that. Turning it clockwise, you'll notice it gets narrower until ultimately we have a very tight notch, which at this point is boosted. We can also go back past the center detent and we can cut those frequencies as well and determine where they are in the frequency range. The Q feature is a really powerful control. It allows you to decide what notes or harmonics are affected, boost, or cut. Now by lifting the times 10 button, we've just moved that curve back down to 80 hertz. And just like we did with the wide EQ, we can roll a narrow Q up or down the frequency range. And of course, we could add these frequencies or subtract them. Combining this center section with a low or high EQ is a really powerful feature. Now here we've taken the shape of the midsection EQ, very narrow, and we've boosted a specific frequency, and we're also raising the low end. Now at this point, what we have is a frequency curve that looks like this, with actually the E note being notched as higher than the rest of the curve. So as you play your guitar, that low E note will now be emphasized even more strong than the rest of the curve. Of course, we can raise the high EQ up. We have a curve that looks like this. Another example of something you can do would be to change the position of the Q and the frequency select. And now what we have is a bass boosted, a treble boosted, and we're actually notching down a specific frequency, which will tend to remove it from the mix. This frequency that we've just notched out with a very tight Q is 265 hertz. And this is what the curve would look like. Turning all the knobs back to zero brings the whole unit back to flat. There's a lot of tone power in the K4. It's a great tool for sculpting your tone. But it's also a problem solver as well. In a lot of live environments, you may encounter feedback or other undesirable tones. And I want to take a second and show you how to use the center section of the K4 EQ to solve that problem. Now what we want to do is leave these two controls, the bass and the treble, on flat. And the idea is to find the tone you don't want by making it louder. So you take the gain control and turn it all the way up. Take the Q control and make it as wide as you can. Now what you're going to do is by playing or having someone else play, you want to start sweeping through the frequency spectrum with the frequency select knob. And the idea is to find the undesirable tone and actually make it really obnoxious. Once you find that, then you can go to the opposite side of the detent with the gain control and start turning that frequency down. If you find that you're actually eliminating too many notes, that's when you begin narrowing the Q setting. You start turning that clockwise until you're, instead of having a wide curve, you start shaping into more of a notch. At that point, you might want to do some fine adjustments by rotating the frequency select control until you isolate those frequencies and again then dial them out of the mix. That's a basic primer on how to use a parametric EQ to solve feedback or other unwanted tone problems in real life situations. In your K4 user's guide there's some sample settings. What we want to do is take the opportunity now to play some of those sample settings for you and also show you what they look like on the graph. The first thing I'm going to do though is just play with everything flat. The controls are set flat on the guitar and the controls are set flat on the K4 unit to give you a reference point to listen to. Now depending on what you're listening on, if you're listening on a small TV set with small speakers, you may not hear as dramatic a difference as is actually occurring. You might want to think about getting a set of headphones or something to listen a little closer. So first, just going to play with everything flat.
Now I'm going to go ahead and turn to the first sample setting in the user's guide to let you hear what that sounds like. What that is, is the low EQ is boosted slightly, the treble is boosted slightly, the midsection is at 80 hertz with a fairly narrow Q and we've boosted that up as well. And now I'm going to play the same line using that EQ setting. The second user setting this error has a little bit to do with cutting some of those mids we talked about in the problem solving section. So what I'm going to do here is now instead of boosting at the mids, I'm going to cut. And instead of cutting 80 hertz, I'm actually going to go up and cut some of the mids out. And I'm going to do it fairly dramatically, keeping the cue a little wider than might be in the user's guide to give you a better idea of what that control would actually sound like if it was uh, dialed back almost all the way. Now for sake of reference, I'm going to take everything back to flat and strum the passage again. Now it's possible when you're adjusting these controls to boost the high end to the point where it's almost painful. So you want to be careful when you're adjusting these things. But again, by pushing in the times 10 button and rotating the frequency select all the way up to the 8 kilohertz range and a fairly tight Q, we're going to go to the third setting in the book and let you hear what that sounds like. As you can see, there is a lot of power with the K4. It's not hard to master. A little bit of practice will go a long way. One of them evenings, the sky is turning red Black crows are flying all around my head Outside my window, that Santa Ana blows Headed out of the Southland, down to Mexico It's one of those evenings We're taking the long way home Just one of those evenings Taking the long way home 